Our text will be Romans chapter number 8 and verse 26. Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 26. Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I want you to notice a phrase in this verse. He says, We know not what we should pray for as we ought. How is your prayer life? Are you satisfied, happy, content with your prayer life? Or do you feel that you should spend more time in prayer? Do you think you can be a better prayer or a better prayer warrior? I want to preach on a subject. It's a heavy subject. It's a deep subject. I think it's a subject as Christians that we talk about a lot, but maybe we don't work at enough. I think we all agree that we should pray more and we should be serious about our prayer life. But I want to admit to you, I think all of us could possibly admit that we don't have all of this figured out. I think Romans 8.26 is a real good summation for all of us. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. And so I hope that we can get some help from the Bible. I do want to clarify something before we get into this subject of unanswered prayer because that's where I really want to tune in on with this message. But I want you to understand dispensationally, you need to make sure you put the Bible in its right perspective because oftentimes people run over to Old Testament passages like 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, then will I hear from heaven and will heal their land and so forth. And they take that and apply that to America or they apply, apply that to the church. And those verses have no truth application at all to the Christian or to the United States of America. That verse, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, is a reference to the prosperity of the nation of Israel contingent upon their prayer of repentance. Now, dispensationally, you need to understand that. I think you need to understand if someone gets their arm cut off and you're there maybe at a work site, a job site, and somebody gets their arm cut off, you don't gather around and start praying for God to put the arm back on. You say, well, they could have done that in Christ's day. Yeah, if Jesus is standing there, he put the ear back on Malchus's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. But we're not there in the, uh, the time of Christ. Therefore, we don't pray those types of prayers. Consequently, the miracles and signs and wonders that are given to the Jews that you see in the book of the Acts of the Apostles where you have little pieces of Paul's aprons and clothing being passed around to people, they touch it and they get healed. That stuff is not applicable for us today, no matter what the charismatic televangelists try to tell you in order to get money from you. So I think dispensationally we need to understand what we should pray for and what we should not pray for, first of all. Now, Paul prayed. Now, we understand from the Bible that Paul's the apostle to the Gentiles. We understand that God gave the revelations for the mystery of the body of Christ, details that relate to salvation by grace through faith in this age for us to follow. So we have Paul's epistles for that. Three quarters of the New Testament for us. So therefore, I think Paul as a pattern, he said he was a pattern for those that hereafter should believe, we need to follow Paul's pattern, and Paul did practice prayer. As a matter of fact, Paul prayed for specific things. I won't read the actual verses, I'll just give you the summation of it. Paul prayed for deliverance when he was locked up in jail. That's a good thing to pray for. He asked for prayer for him to be able to get out to the Romans and to the Philippians. Also, when he writes the letter to Philemon, he mentions that being that he's asking for God to deliver him, and he's sure that their prayers will help him get delivered. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, Paul told us to pray for governmental leaders. Not so the governmental leaders can just be blessed and have prosperity and so forth and so on. But he said, you pray for those in authority that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life. And so Paul prayed for that. 
Paul also prayed for unsaved people to be saved and reconciled to God. He said, be ye reconciled to God. And he said over in Romans chapter 10, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul prayed that he would have opportunities to be able to visit believers and preach to them and teach to them. He mentions that in Romans and also in 2 Timothy chapter 1. And then he prayed many times for the spiritual growth, get that, spiritual growth of believers. In Colossians chapter 1, I'll give you an example. There are many verses like this. Verse number 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, unto patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. So Paul prayed for believers spiritual growth and well-being. He also prayed that people would help him with ministry as far as giving and receiving and as far as the gospel going out. He says, pray that the word of the Lord would have free course. And he mentions that prayer of people contributing and helping in that ministry as well. Now he also gave exhortation for believers for us to pray. You say, well, preacher, are you telling me that 2 Chronicles 7.14 is not for us? A lot of these Old Testament uh, prayers are not for us. Now, devotionally, there's a lot of great prayers in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you go to the book of Psalms, there are a lot of very applicable prayers for all of us. Because the spiritual life of a believer in any age has depth to it as far as it relates to their relationship with God. So when you read the book of Psalms, Make me to walk in thy commandments. That's a great prayer. Lead me and guide me. That's a great prayer. All kind of great prayers in the Old Testament. What I'm telling you though is you need to be real careful not just to extrapolate verses that deal with maybe some of these things that aren't even applicable for us. I'm not going to pray for somebody to go blind if they're an enemy of the gospel. But Paul did and Paul got his prayer answered and the guy went blind. Over in Acts 13 or 14. So you want to make sure you understand that. Now Paul believed in prayer and we should believe in prayer. We need to be a people of prayer. And Paul exhorted us to pray. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 dealing with a husband and wife. He said that you may give yourself to fasting and prayer. Turn off the TV. Turn off the phone. And spend some time in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, you know the verse. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Romans 12, 12, continuing instant in prayer. 1 Timothy 2, 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now we have a lot of problems when it comes to our prayer lives. A lot of problems. We have a lot of problems with our personal prayers. I believe we have ignorant prayers. Prayers that God is not going to answer. Prayers that God will not answer because they're prayers made out of ignorance. For instance, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God, heal our land. If all the churches would just pray, then God would heal the land. What do you mean by that? Oh, I know what you mean. You mean some kind of spiritual awakening, some kind of spiritual revival. That's not the context of 2 Chronicles 7, 14 at all. That has to do with physical rain coming down so they can have crops and they can have food because God judged them as far as prosperity was concerned, as far as their bellies were concerned. God judged them based on their sin, and if they turned away from God, God turned off the water. But there are a lot of ignorant prayers, praying out of bounds. Somebody dies, you don't pray and ask God to raise them back from the dead. Consequently, you need to take this thing a step further. And I know I'm stepping on the proverbial elephant in the room, but I'm telling you 
There's a lot of these ignorant prayers that are going on. Instead of accepting God's will and having faith to go through the trial, we pray for God to overturn the thing, and many things God simply is not going to overturn. Independent prayers. Prayers that are without faith and selfish. They're akin to idolatrous prayers. James 4.3, he says, You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. The reason you ask is for your own self-gain. It's all about self. God's not hearing that kind of a prayer. Indolent prayers. What's that? Lazy prayers that have no fervency. Luke 18, 1, Jesus said, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. You seek, you ask, you knock. So what happens if I keep knocking and He doesn't answer? Well, you need to evaluate that thing. Or are you praying out of bounds? And maybe God is not going to answer your prayer simply because you're not supposed to be praying about it. So He says, quit praying about it. Maybe he says yes, and he answers the prayer. Maybe he says no, or maybe he says nothing. So what do you do? You just keep knocking. You pray, and you don't faint. If you're not sure that it's the will of God or not, you search the Scriptures. You try to find if you're praying against God's will. If you're not praying against God's will to the best of your ability, you keep praying and praying and praying until you get an answer. Now, we're going to discuss this problem that we all have regarding prayer. And I think the biggest problem probably has to do with unanswered prayer. I don't know about you, but one day I'm looking forward to hearing the voice on the other, other end. I know we feel the Holy Spirit and He makes intercession with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I know sometimes we feel the moving of the Spirit and we hear His voice through the Word of God. I get that. I know it's a still, small voice, but audibly, one day, we're going to hear the voice on the other end. Many times people pray and they simply are having a conversation with themselves. You want to be real careful not to do that. You want to make sure you know and you address God the Father in prayer. You pray in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't have any merit and any basis by which to pray to God. And you pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. You pray in the Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit. So how do you get filled with the Spirit? Well, you need to get emptied of self. And you need to get emptied of sin if you're going to be filled with the Spirit. Now I want to give three or four things here. And we'll start off in 2 Samuel chapter 12. These are kind of heavy, so... I want to encourage you to pray about these matters, to take notes on this. This is a subject that I have not mastered by any stretch of the imagination. I would say I am a very weak prayer warrior. I would say that uh, I need as much help with this as anybody. But I do think we have a problem with prayer because of this silence on the other end of the line. Because we're living by faith, not by sight. We're in the times of the Gentiles. We're in the times where we are to walk by faith. We're in the times where we are to have trust and in confidence in God, even though we don't hear His voice. And so it's difficult when we don't get an answer to our prayers. What is the answer to unanswered prayers? Oftentimes, many Christians just throw up their hands and they quit. They stop praying, they get out of church, they quit reading their Bible, they quit trusting God, they formulate opinions and ideas about God and about how God feels about them because of an unanswered prayer. Now let's just hold on for a minute and let's go through the scriptures and look at this and see if we can find a few examples of unanswered prayer and get some insight. Notice 2 Samuel chapter number 12, and yes I am using an Old Testament example here. 2 Samuel chapter number 12, you know the story. This is after David's sin with Bathsheba. And you know that God was very displeased with David. And he sent Nathan the prophet with a parable to illustrate how far David had gone astray. And he tells him this parable and then he tells him, frankly, in verse number 7, Thou art the man. And then he begins to apply the parable to David and tells him, 
God is ringing your bell. You're it. You have messed up. You have committed adultery and murder. You're in trouble. And David's thinking, okay, I'm about to die. The lightning bolt's about to fall out of heaven and God's going to kill me. But what does Nathan tell him? He tells him in verse 13 after David says, I have sinned against the Lord. He says, thou hast put away thy sin. The Lord has put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. But notice also verse number 14. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Remember David and Bathsheba had a baby together. And God tells him the baby's going to die. What does David do? Verse 16. David therefore besought God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. You say, well, there's no need for him to do that in verse number 15 because God already said that the child was going to die. So why does David even ask? He's trying to find the will of God. Notice the text. Now, I'm going to tell you this because, and I want to show you this, because if you remember when Saul was chasing David, David gets down in Ramah, I believe it is, and he says... Will the, uh, will the people deliver me up? And, uh, and, and uh, God says, the people will deliver thee up. So what does David do? David leaves, and he tells his men to disperse, and they get out of town. So God told him something was going to happen, so then David made provision so what God said did not happen. So obviously we see the permissive will of God as in, uh, in contrast to the a sovereign will of God, if you want to use that term. So you want to make sure you back up and you take a gander at this thing a little bit loosely instead of locking down on it because when you're going through something, you're trying to work out what God's doing and then God's going to work on you as to what He's doing with you as well. So what does David do? He prays. He goes in, he fasts, he prays. The Bible tells us in verse 18, the seventh day the child died. The servants feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him the child is dead? Verse 19, but when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. Verse 22, watch it. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Notice verse 22. Who can tell? Similar to the passage in Romans chapter 8, we know not what we should pray for as we ought. David says, I don't really understand God's will. I'm going to pray and see if God will have mercy on me. And so we see that this unanswered prayer has to do, and I told you this is heavy and this is hard preaching. This has to do with God's punishment. Now, God works multiple things. We don't know what God might have spared that child from. There's another passage over in 1 Kings chapter number 14 with Jeroboam. And he has a child that dies. And God tells his wife the reason that this child dies is because some good thing is found in him. God is protecting him from the wickedness and from the destruction that was to come by taking him early. God has a plan and a purpose oftentimes far beyond what we can see or perceive. However, God does punish sin. And we see here David takes responsibility. When Nathan preaches to him and he says, Thou art the man, he says, I have sinned before the Lord. That's a little bit different than what Pharaoh, when Pharaoh said, I have sinned, and when Balaam said, I have sinned, and when Judas said, I have sinned. David meant it. There is responsibility. There is repentance. There is remorse. Verse 16, there is a request. And you'll notice... 
there is a reception. He receives what God gives to him. What does he do? Notice it in verse number 20. After all this happens, one of the first things he does, he goes into the house of the Lord and worships. And then he restarts. David never even thought so much of himself to get mad at God, to get bitter at God, to hold his fist and shake his hand at God. He took responsibility and he moved on. Notice also he didn't beat himself up the rest of his life because of this. And this is a rough thing. Can you imagine being responsible for the death of your child? You say, I can never get past that. You can do all things through Christ. Paul the Apostle had Christians killed and tortured and no doubt some of the churches he preached in, especially when he went back to Jerusalem, I believe he probably saw people and they were family members of people that he had had killed. How did he sleep at night? God got him through that. And God can get you through whatever punishment by way of an unanswered prayer that he's given in your life. David restarted and moved on and so did his wife and they had a son named Solomon who becomes heir of the throne. So we have unanswered prayer, not just God's punishment, but I want you to go to John chapter number 11 of another very familiar story. I'm sure you're familiar with this. John chapter number 11, the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead. And here in John chapter number 11, you know that Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus. I mean, he was friends with them. He would stop by their house and eat, and Martha would cook, and Mary would sit at Bible study, and, and they, were, they were close to Christ when he would come to Bethany. And so whenever Lazarus got sick, they sent word that they needed Jesus ASAP. You'll see that in verse number 4. But when Jesus gets the message, he says, the sickness is not for death, but for the glory of God. And what does he do? Notice in verse number 6, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. After that, he saith to the disciples, let us go into Judea again. Lazarus dies. And Jesus was not there to answer their prayer. So we see, first of all, the perspective from people. Notice in their ignorance... Their knowledge is very limited. When Jesus said in verse number 4, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of my God might be glorified thereby, maybe the messenger carried that back to them, or maybe he didn't. I don't know. Even if he did, they were ignorant of what it meant. I mean, how could a death be for the glory of God? How could something bad stand for something good? Their perspective was that of ignorance. You'll see knowledge here, and that knowledge oftentimes is only held by the Lord. There are many things in our own life that we're not privy to. And I think we get puffed up, especially in this modern age, where we think we can become experts on everything because we can type it in a stupid phone and get some quick little answer even though you haven't researched the situation, even though you don't have a Ph.D. or a master's degree in that particular field, now all of a sudden you stayed at the Holiday Inn and you're the expert. You know, you studied, you know, some uh, five-lesson course online and studied some Bible thing in 24 hours, and now you're correcting the preacher. You know, we have this mentality nowadays that we have all of this knowledge and man is so far advanced. I think we're just as remedial as men have always been. Our knowledge is so very limited, we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg. And you'll notice here in their own ignorance, they dig themselves into a hole of desperation, discouragement, and depression. Notice that not only do we have knowledge, but we have revelation. Jesus makes the statement in verse number 4, this is for the glory of God. He tells his disciples here that he's going to go in verse number 11 to wake Lazarus out of sleep. They don't really understand that either. And he even says he was glad he wasn't there in verse 15. So Lazarus could die. So all these things are revelations coming from Jesus Christ. They are little snippets of truth that, is, that has to be unpackaged. For the people to understand that. And of course now after the cross and now after we have the Bible, we can look back and we can understand a lot of these things that even the disciples could not grasp at that time. 
You know, God doesn't always reveal what He's doing while He's doing it. And you're praying and you're asking, Lord, I need you now. We've only got a few days. He's sick. He's going to die. But He does not tell you what's going on or the way He tells you, you do not have that revelation yet. The perspective from people is often different than the perspective from providence. Their ignorance leads to their impertinence. They're very impertinent here. Notice in verses 21 and 32 we have the same comment made by both sisters to Jesus. Very rebellious, very insubordinate. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. When Mary comes, she says the same thing in verse number 32. Exact words. Almost like they're doing this. If you wouldn't have had been here, if you would have come when we called, if you would have answered our prayer, why didn't you answer it? You don't love us anymore? You have something against us? Have you turned on us? Or maybe you're not God at all. Maybe you don't have the power that we think you have. Maybe we were just fooled. Maybe we've deceived ourselves. You see where the train goes? Unanswered prayer can cause a lot of bitterness and a lot of, a lot of hurt. And if you don't understand the Bible correctly, then you will not develop the right type of theology. In other words, you won't think right about God. And if you don't understand these things, you won't think right about prayer. And you'll misunderstand when God does not answer. And sometimes God does not answer, not because He's punishing us, but because of His providence. God has a plan and a purpose greater than what we can see in front of us. I know it's hard for us to get it. I'm not trying to be mean to you, but you are not as smart as you think you are. You are not as wise and discerning as you think you are. You do not have it all figured out. I don't want to be mean to you, but I'm telling you, you're just kind of like an animal. And I know we're different than animals, but I'm saying you are trying to survive. You're trying to put food in your mouth. You're trying to be comfortable. You're going through life. You care about your family. You're dealing with things. And when you have a trouble or trial, you cry out for God and you expect that He's bigger than you. He ought to deliver you. And you think, oh, just because God's a God of love, then He needs to do everything I want Him to, to do because that's how you show somebody that you love them. You are about as shallow as a mud puddle. You don't do everything your kids want you to do. How are they going to grow? And you might have something bigger and better in store for them, so therefore you tell them no, or you don't answer them right away, because you've got another plan in mind. And that's exactly what was taking place here. We see the perspective from Providence, verse number 4, that's his plan to glorify himself. What a great thing to be a part of glorifying Jesus Christ. And then his purpose, look in verse 45. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. When you get over to chapter number uh, 12, the Bible tells us about Lazarus. They wanted to see Lazarus as well after he was raised. Because that by reason of him, Lazarus, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. This was a huge Re outreach for people to see the power of Jesus Christ. And Jesus had that in his mind the whole time. He didn't choose to reveal it. And by the way, God does not owe you an explanation. If you read the book of Job, one thing that should strike you when you get to the end of the book is God never explained to Job all the reasons and the whys. We find later on that there's something going on behind the scenes that God did not feel obligated to explain to Job. And might I tell you that God does not feel obligated to tell you everything. It's amazing to me some of the science that's in the Bible. When you go back in the Old Testament and you read about God telling Moses to give instruction to the nation of Israel and all those laws for them to wash their hands in running water and all those kind of things... It's pretty interesting because it shows that God is keeping back the, the disease and the germs and all the rules in Leviticus 13 and 14 on quarantine and social distancing with leprosy and so forth. It's very telling. But you know, there are a lot of things in the Bible God never felt obligated to reveal. 
And there's a lot of things I guarantee you right now going on in your personal life that you're praying about that God has not answered and He does not feel an obligation to answer you yet. And it may be that there's a plan in motion. It may be that He sees, and He does see, a whole lot further down the road than you do. And you are simply to trust His providence. Number three, come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. I hope you're getting some help from this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Because we all have problems with this. This is something I believe that a lot of Christians struggle with in their own personal prayer lives. And how to relate in their relationship to God. They love God and then when God allows something to happen in their life, a lot of times they take it the wrong way. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. Paul says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether I in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now here we have... The Apostle Paul experiencing some things as a result of an abundance of revelations. We know that God gave him special revelation. He showed him a lot of these mysteries. I believe what this passage is referring to is back in Acts 14 when Paul was stoned. The disciples thought he was dead. They drug him out. And he's standing there, and all of a sudden he wakes up. I believe he actually died. He was caught up to the third heaven. He got to see some of the glories that John wrote about in the book of Revelation. But then he is put back down in this body. He goes from glory back down to grief. He goes from seeing the splendor of God back to the suffering of the flesh. And he wakes back up, and he's in this body, and he's crying out, and he's like, man... If, you, if I could only tell you what God let me see. But God told him, don't you talk about it because I got that thing reserved for John. And John got to write about the mysteries of heaven and New Jerusalem and all of those things. But he relates in this passage that he has a thorn in the flesh. So we see his pain. It's called a thorn in the flesh. I don't think it's a literal thorn in his thumb or anything like that. But you know when you get thorns, if you get something like that, and you try to pull it out, maybe it breaks off, and there it is deep down in the flesh, you have a couple of options. You can either take the knife and you can dig in your flesh and go in there and then extract it with some tweezers, or you can leave it in there for a while and let it hopefully work itself out. Now, if it's too deep, you need to go ahead and go in there, but if not, you can let it stay in there. But if you let it stay in there and you bump something, you, you hit it and you rub across it, you, it's going to light you up. You will feel it. And so that thorn in the flesh is a great analogy for us to understand. Every time, time you bump it, every time you barely touch it, it goes off. You never can get a moment's rest. You know it's there. It reminds you. And Paul had this thorn. Where did this thing come from? It may have been his eye condition. He tells the Galatians that he, he said, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given to me. He says also to the Galatians that uh, you see how large a letter I've written unto you. Maybe he wrote... It, the Galatians, the book of Galatians is not a very long book as far as longevity, but it maybe was big letters that he wrote out. Then he says over in Corinthians, he says, my bodily presence is weak. Paul had some kind of eye disease. We know when he was saved, he was blinded for three days. 
But he had a thorn in the flesh. So we have a physical aspect of it that affected his physical being. Now think about this. I just thought of this earlier. During the time that Paul writes this, you still have the apostolic signs going on. In other words, people are still getting healed miraculously. Paul even has the ability of healing. But God is not allowing him to experience this healing. That had to be a tough blow. And also you notice here from the text this pain is physical. It's in his flesh. But then it's also spiritual. He mentions that it's the messenger of Satan. There's a spiritual side to all of this. The devil will use pain against you. He will use pain to get you to turn against God when God doesn't remove that pain. And so there's a messenger of Satan here, and so he has to be real careful. You'll notice not just his pain, but you'll notice his prayers in verse number 8. He prays three times. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. It's not wrong to pray about the thorns in your life. Paul says in Hebrews there, if you have know someone in the body, pray as being in the body with them. Consider them that are in the body as, as being in the body with them. If someone's sick or someone's hurting, we should pray that they have to... There's nothing wrong with wanting to have relief from pain. That is a normal feeling. And Paul prayed about it. Paul didn't know if this was a temporary thing. He didn't know God's will on this. So he's praying. Notice the answer was not a direct answer. Yes, I will remove the thorn. But it was an indirect answer. In other words, Paul, I'm not going to remove the thorn. But I'm going to give you grace to live with the thorn. So we have sometimes an unanswered prayer in the sense of the prayer doesn't get answered the way we want it to be answered although it technically is answered but we can include this under our heading of unanswered prayers so what is this it's not God's punishment it's not God's providence it's God's process you see he's using this thorn to help Paul not to hinder Paul at first, Paul thinks this is going to hinder him. He's thinking, Lord, I could do so much more if I were healthy. But God says, no, I'm helping you with this thorn because I'm helping you not to be full of pride. I'm helping to keep you humble. There's a purpose for the thorn in your life. There's a purpose for the cross in your life. You might not know it. You might not realize it. But one thing it helps you to do it helps you to realize how weak you are and how you can become strong through your weakness. That's what Paul says. Paul realized, I am nothing. Paul realized how weak he was and if God didn't give him that grace. Now notice this grace. We see his grief. His grief is great, but we see God's grace is greater. Notice God's grace. My grace is sufficient, verse number 9. This is specific grace. This is God's grace, not in saving grace, like we talk about God saving grace. God, grace is God giving you something you don't deserve. It's, a, it's an overflow of God's goodness. And here we have specific grace. In other words, this is grace for the thorn. This is grace for the trial. This is grace for the trouble. Specific grace, and it's also strengthening grace. Paul is weak, so God gives him grace to strengthen him. And it's also sufficient grace. He gives him just enough grace each day to make it. God will give you strength. That passage over in Deuteronomy, As thy days, so shall thy strength be. God will give you enough grace to get through today. Like Jesus told the disciples when he was teaching them about the kingdom prayer, the idea was, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what's on tomorrow. Just let the day take care of itself. God will give you grace to get through today. We don't know what tomorrow may bring. Sufficient grace. But not only Paul's grief and his grace, but we see his growth. God is doing something through this. There's a process that he's working on. There was a Scottish, Scottish preacher by the name of George Matheson. He was born in 1842, died in 1906. And this man, he was very well acquainted with suffering. We know of him primarily because of a couple of hymns he wrote. One of them 
more popular, O oh, Love That Will Not Let Me Go, he wrote that hymn maybe in response to some of the trials and troubles he had. When he was a teenager, he noticed his eyes getting worse and worse, and his eyesight was so bad to where he was nearly blind. When he went through seminary, he was called to preach and went through seminary. His sisters, they took courses as well so they could tutor him and help him. Back in that day, they didn't have a lot of the things they have today to help with that type of a thing, so they helped him get through his training. As a preacher, he preached in a small church and he became discouraged, especially on one Sunday night when so many seats were empty. And he still preached and prepared and preached his heart out. Little did he know there was a man there from the large St. Bernard Church. That was the name of it. It's very fitting that it's a large church. The St. Bernard Church in Edinburgh was there in the congregation listening, and they were looking for a pastor. They called him to be the pastor. He went on to pastor that church for many, many years and became one of the most well-known preachers in Scotland. Queen Victoria came to hear him preach, and he wrote several hymns. Going back to his younger days, one of his griefs and sorrows was not just his blindness, but as a result of his blindness, his fiance broke off her engagement with him. George Matheson, he never did marry. He lived a single life his entire life, but he wrote hymns with such power and such passion. We still sing them today. He said this. He said he often thanked God for his roses, but not once for his thorn, his blindness. He admitted he looked forward to another world where he could get compensation for his cross. Then he began to see this cross as present glory. His prayer changed. Teach me the glory of the cross. Teach me the value of my thorn. Show me that I have climbed to thee by the path of pain. Show me that my tears have made rainbows. And I think that's what Paul was going through. He says, I'm weak, but you're strong. Finally, I want to close with... Matthew 26, you know the passage. For the sake of time, I won't read through it. But this is, of course, the greatest of all. The Lord Jesus Christ going through the Garden of Gethsemane. And here we don't see God's punishment. We don't see God's providence. We don't see God's process. But here, when Jesus Christ kneels down and goes through that thing three times, not my will, but thy will be done, we see God's prerogative. You'll notice Jesus' pain in verses 37 and 38. He says he's sorrowful and very heavy. His soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death, he says. But his persistence in prayer, hour after hour after hour, he goes and he prays. And there's redundance in this. You remember he warned the disciples about vain repetition. But oftentimes we do need to be repetitive in our prayers. And he asked the Father three times, If it's possible, take this cup from me. That wasn't the cup of death. He wasn't afraid to die. That cup had to do with the wrath of God being poured out on Jesus Christ. That had to do with Jesus becoming sin for us. Jesus who knew no sin. Jesus that had never been separated from God the Father in fellowship at all. He always said, My Father. But when he hung on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God did forsake him and God's judgment fell on Christ. But he left that place when he said, Not my will, thine be done. He left with the peace of God that passes all understanding. You know, he's the only one that didn't get upset during the whole betrayal and arrest and trial. Peter got so upset he pulled out a sword and began to try to kill people and cut off Malchus's ear. Jesus calmed him down, put the ear back on. He told Judas, where are you going to take me? Went through the whole process. When he was reviled, he reviled not again. He had God's perfect peace because he knew he was to be surrendered to the will of God. That's a Gethsemane prayer. And some of us, were still praying the selfish prayers. We're still praying the ignorant prayers. We're still praying the prayers all about us. And we think we understand. And we don't understand why God can't see it the way we see it. We 
in our own hubris and our own pride, we fail to yield to the fact that God knows a whole lot more than we do, that he's got a plan, that he might have a process that he's working on us, and that he also has a prerogative, and it's up to us to be submissive to his will, not for God to be submissive to our will. That's a Gethsemane prayer. Are you praying according to God's will or according to your will? 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. How have you been handling the unanswered prayers in your life? Are you getting impatient? If you're praying according to the will of God, for instance, if you're praying for someone to be saved, keep praying for someone to be saved because that's God's will as well. You're praying right. Maybe you're not quite sure if it's the will of God yet. Try the spirits. Keep praying. Make sure what you're hearing and what people are telling you, what the circumstances are revealing to you, make sure that it lines up with the Bible and lines up with God. Well, preacher, I've been praying about moving to Timbuktu. Which church are you going to go to? You know, First Baptist of Timbuktu? Well, I hadn't thought about that. Well, you're not even praying according to God's will. If you're not praying about your spiritual life, if you're just praying about a $2 an hour raise that you're going to get in Timbuktu, you need to quit praying about it. Let's don't be ignorant in our prayers. Let's live by faith and pray by faith. God may be doing something in your life. The best thing to do is to have faith and trust. I'll close with this. I wish it was George Matheson. I could have read and I've got his hymns. You need to look those hymns up. They're really good. But this is very fitting. Our Father knows what's best for us, so why should we complain? We always want the sunshine, but he knows there must be rain. We love the sound of laughter and the merriment of cheer, but our hearts would lose their tenderness if we never shed a tear. With suffering and with sorrow, he tests us not to punish us, punish us but to help us meet tomorrow. For growing trees are strengthened when they withstand the storm, and the sharp cut of the chisel gives the diamond grace and form. God never hurts us needlessly, and he never wastes our pain, for every loss he sends us is followed by rich gain. And when we count the blessings that God so freely sent, we'll find no cause for murmuring and no time to lament. For our Father loves his children, and to him all things are plain. So he never sends us pleasure when the soul's deep need is pain. So whenever we are troubled and when everything goes wrong, it's just God working in us to make our spirit strong. How are you handling unanswered prayer? Are you getting bitter? Are you refusing to see your own sin? Are you refusing to submit? Let's live by faith. Father, thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for these great examples. Lord, help us to bring these into focus and to keep praying the right way and not to faint in our prayers and not to turn against you or to think that you've turned against us. Lord, we know that you love us unconditionally. And God, we're the ones who cause all the trouble, not you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that you might help them with unanswered prayer. Lord, we do pray for an answer. We pray for help when we don't get the answer. We pray for peace to trust you in the hard times. We thank you for this book that guides us and clarifies so many things in a very dark and cloudy time. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.